hello. So you want to start or you want to improve your content uh, framework, you're on the right place. Today we're going to talk with Melanie about the content full framework and how you can optimize the content generation and content, I don't know, reusing. Okay, let, let's wait. Wait a little bit and stay tuned because we'll be back soon, soon, soon. Hello, hello. Here I am back. <laughs> Marco Novo this side. And today we're going to talk about content marketing. I've seen this lady, Melanie, with Ryan talking about content marketing. And I say, oh my God, I love so much content marketing. I should reach out to Melanie and ask her if she wants to join my show. Thankfully, <laughs> she accepted. Uh, meanwhile, I, I bought the book and I should recommend at in in a minute I will send I will share with you the the link so you can go and buy because you should uh, the book from Melanie and let's bring her to the screen I'll let her in the basement with a cookie and a glass of water <laughs> <laughs> okay please if you are watching us another place that not LinkedIn event, please join us on the LinkedIn event so I can manage your comments in the most easiest way. Okay, so there's the link here. Please join us and let's bring Melanie. Hello, Melanie. How are you? <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. It's a it's a pleasure. And for me, there's there are some some topics which are more uh, from the from more from the heart than others. And for me, content marketing it's it's the, one of the things I I fell in love with live streaming because I first of all I loved uh, content marketing. I was figuring out which platform will fit better my my way to work and to and yeah. i and i found uh, live streaming and it's it's amazing for me uh, uh, to see uh, people talking about how to optimize uh, content marketing the the old frame because for me it's it's so important framing because i'm 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 really lazy <laughs> yeah. i have so short uh, spam uh, span of of time to to work right. and so if there's a way to to shortcut, that's where you have me. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> Stephanie, thank you very much. I will ask you. Well, first I will ask people to say hello, so, people who are there, please, and join us here on the LinkedIn event so I can see your your comments and put them on the screen. Melanie, please introduce yourself, and then we go to the conversation. If it's that okay. Yeah, so hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I hope to see some of your comments and questions and, and look forward to answering them with you. So I'm Melanie Diesel, I'm the Chief Content Officer of Story Fuel, and you can see our little, uh, our little URL there if you wanna learn more about what we do, but essentially what we do is help marketers and creators and anyone who has to tell their story through content do it a little more efficiently. So we do things like corporate trainings, run masterminds, we have the book, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, and our whole mission is to help people fall in love with storytelling and coming up with content ideas as much as we do. So my background is as a journalist. I came from that world where I was coming up with tons of content ideas every single day. And so I know that when you have a system, it can be done easily and efficiently. And so that's really that's really my mission is I know I love storytelling. I understand the power of sharing my message through content. And I want to help other people come to love it just as much as I do. Perfect. Well, you, you, just by your introduction, I I got so many questions. <laughs> First one, I think I think, uh, uh, and I see people. Please join us on this link so you I can get your comments on screen because there's hello Priscilla, hello Luis, hello Ilse, que tal? Hello Priscilla again, hello Philip. Please join us on the event <laughs> so I can manage all the comments here, please. So. Journalists, they 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 have these challenges because uh, 
since the digital came and i i'm i'm i say this all the time i think and please correct me if i'm wrong the frame for for uh, writing from journalism is very similar to content to write content to 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 digital marketing digital marketing don't yeah. you think it's a, i think it, you're you're the best example <laughs> It's it's a nice way for a journalist to uh, pivoting the, the the career uh, yeah. going to, to content marketing. There's there's a lot of really similar skills. So I think the best content marketing is actually mimicked off the style of journalism. And what I mean by that is it really focuses on the audience. It has a lot of good sources that can be trusted to provide more information on a topic. And it's written with the audience in mind, not necessarily just what you want to say, but really mindful of the audience's needs and habits and how we can make our content as useful and as informative as possible. And because of that, it's actually really easy for journalists to make that pivot and start doing slightly more branded writing through content marketing. And, you know, I understand there are some concerns about objectivity. How can I cover the news and then also write on behalf of a brand? Most times people aren't doing those two things at the same time. What we're often talking about is folks who maybe were in a newsroom and got laid off or their newsroom downsized, or maybe they freelance and they already write for many different publications anyway. In those cases, it makes for a nice next chapter or side project to be able to also write on behalf of brands. And again, when you're doing that in a transparent way and you're doing it ethically, it's actually not too much of a conflict of interest. You know, To be able to interview someone and share their story, whether that lives on a brand's blog or whether it lives in the newspaper, as long as you're doing it wholeheartedly, you're being truthful, you know, I think it's okay to do a little bit of both. And obviously, again, every newspaper, every publication has their own rules. You want to abide by those. But I know so many journalists who, you know, weren't able to find work or were laid off in some way and have found sort of a second home, a next chapter in content marketing and have been able to use all those skills to tell really great, compelling stories, uh, you know, just on behalf of a brand. Perfect. Because... I don't know there, but here in Portugal, it's it's still a, a struggle to make understand to entrepreneurs and to managers the yeah. importance of content marketing. I think there's so misunderstanding about this. Do you have that struggles there, and how can you overcome? Uh, okay, <laughs> maybe you can talk about the most common um, cons. Yeah. And how do you overcome them? <laughs> sure. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions or challenges when it comes to content marketing that most of them are pretty easy to overcome. So the first one we already touched on, I think a lot of people think, well, isn't this sort of sneaky or deceptive? Isn't there something kind of messed up and icky about writing for a brand? So to clear that up, all the data shows that people actually trust content from brands as long as it's transparent and providing value. So as long as the content you create as your brand or for your brand is honest and open about the fact that you're a brand creating this content and it's truly valuable and it's something you can and have the authority to talk about, people are still gonna find value in that. So that's how we get rid of that objection about it being deceptive or sneaky, right? Uh, the other misconception is that it's easy or has immediate results. A lot of people think, well, okay, we're just going to start a blog and by the end of the week, we're going to have a million new customers, right? I think it's really important to understand that building a content series, you know, building a, a blog or a YouTube series or a live show like this takes time. You have to build audience. You have to build a reputation with your customers. Think about some of the most famous TV shows that we know, something like Friends or The Simpsons or Game of Thrones that were on for many seasons. By the time you get to those later seasons, there's more fans, they're more passionate, and they're more likely to make other related purchases and conversations because they've had time to get invested season after season, you know, episode after episode. We need to give our content that same chance that the blog may not have as many followers the first month or even the first year, but if we do it consistently over time, we can see those results in the long term. So I think those are probably the two main misconceptions is like we can get immediate results or there's something deceptive and sneaky about it. Well, I, I, I will give you two more. <laughs> you yeah. Well, yeah. First, first one, um, 
I'm not a guru. Uh, why should I talk about that? So many people writing or saying uh, things about yeah. this. And the other is, um, I don't know how should I write about or, or make a video about what? Uh, yeah. How you can uh, overcome this uh, crazy thing because it's, it's overthinking. Uh, this guru thing. I, I understand why th this happened because yeah. when you have so many people doing it right, you think there's no room for you, which is a mistake you're making. And yeah. how can I find really good topics to start uh, talking about? So, yeah, th you're absolutely right. I think especially with solopreneurs or individual thought leaders, there's sort of this weird kind of imposter syndrome that's specific to content where they feel, who am I to make a YouTube video or create content on this topic? The one thing I wanna help everyone understand is everyone has value that they can add to their audience or to people that you know are interested in their topic. So the example I always give is, remember when you were a freshman in high school, it was your first year of high school, and you thought the seniors who were three years ahead of you were like the coolest, smartest people who knew everything in the world. There's some version of that in your industry, in your space. You may only be a few steps ahead or a few months ahead or a few years ahead of some of the other folks, but you still have you know, knowledge and experience, you've made mistakes, you've learned things that you can share with people who, even if they're not so far behind you, they're just a few steps behind and you can really add some value. So don't let yourself feel like I'm not important enough, I'm not smart enough. You know, you have experiences that you can share. The other thing is, I think a lot of us have been led to believe that we're not creative, right? And when we think about other parts of our lives where people say, oh, I'm just not good at math. Usually, if you think you're not good at math, what that means is you didn't have a great teacher or you weren't taught the right system, right? Because math is just formulas. And if you can understand those formulas, it becomes much easier to do the calculations. In many ways, what we're doing when we are suddenly given a, a creative responsibility, hey, come up with blog posts every single day, you don't have a formula, you don't have a system, and no one has ever taught you, how do I come up with content ideas in a repeatable way? So once you have that system, once you have a framework or some organized way of doing it, it becomes so much easier and so much more approachable. Even if you're not a creative type, all you need to do is figure out how you can activate that creativity. Perfect, perfect. Well, we have newcomers to the <laughs> to the to the show. Hello, Daniel. How are you, uh, Tony? How are you, Tony? Nice to see you here. And Ryan is here too. Hello, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. <laughs> Hope you're doing fine. Well, because because um, I, I used to say, uh, and for me it's really important. Um, every minute you get stopped, uh, it's every minute you lose the, the possibility to get feedback, to get validation, and to improve. Yeah. And I don't know uh, because uh, I, I I was looking at your your book and I saw there okay there's something important because. Mostly we, we see content in four perspectives, information, uh, education, mm -hmm. inspiration, entertainment, right? I think it's, but uh, there's some, uh, and for me, what this one is truly important is to get feedback and to get feed by your audience because you give them some, some piece of content for them to, to think about, yeah. to give you feedback. And if you don't send, it doesn't matter if it's basic. It doesn't matter. But yeah. send it. And That's you exactly. get something back. <laughs> exactly. So there's a one of my fellow speakers in the marketing space, Brian Fanzo. He has a catchphrase. He says, just press the damn button. It's just time to put something out. I know we have these fears about it won't be perfect or I haven't done it before. But the sooner you start doing it, the sooner you can get better. The idea here is saying, well, I'm, I'm afraid to, I'm not gonna be a good painter, so I'm not even gonna buy the paintbrush, right? Well, of course not. If you don't get started, you can't get good, right? So be okay with putting out, you know, an ugly first draft or, you know, a bad first show or whatever it is. You've got to start somewhere. And the more you do it, the more strong those muscles will get, right? Your creative muscles need to get flexed and worked out too, and they'll get stronger over time. So really, and I, the other thing I'll say too is, if you have been thinking about starting a content project and you haven't started it, 
Now is the time. Now, I know everyone is under a tremendous amount of stress. We're working under conditions we're not normally. We may be dealing with having kids at home that we have to take care of while school's out and you know, dealing with health crisis for ourselves and our family. So be kind to yourself, acknowledge your limits, but also know that your audience has never been more understanding than they are right now because they are in unusual circumstances too. And so if there was ever a time to do a live video where you're learning how to use the, the, the software, where your child or your dog is gonna be in the background, the empathy is 100% there with your audience. We are all in that boat together. So don't be afraid to kind of go out on a limb and try something new because we're all adjusting and trying new things with our marketing and with our lives in general. So now <laughs> is the time. If you've ever wanted to start something and try it out, now is the time. Yeah, and uh, that's one thing but because I'm 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 very straight to the point. I don't like to go eh, well. I'm no, <laughs> not very poetic. And um, one thing I I like to teach to my to my trainees is look, if someone points the finger to you and say, "Yo, why do you do that? If you do it so bad." You just have to say that's why I'm doing it more often. It's to train to get better because that's yeah. the point. And I think the other thing that's really important, and of course, this depends on your brand and your audience, but I think it's important that our audience knows that we are human. So I am very open about the things that I don't do that I recommend others do. If you go look at my YouTube channel, you're going to be ashamed. I'm ashamed, right? <laughs> I haven't posted something in a very long time because I acknowledge that that's not something that's my strong suit. I've tried it. I've posted some great content that I'm proud of but it took me a very long time. And there are other places I can focus my effort on, on content, you know, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and some of these other places that gives me more return for my time. So I try to be open about those things, right? It's okay to try things and have it not work. It's okay to experiment. It's okay to do something and then change your plan. I think the more we can be open and honest with our audience about those things, the more we give them permission to do the exact same thing. Yeah, absolutely. There's Ryan here uh, saying, yes, practice, practice, practice. Everyone is bad, bad at first. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. I think I think we overthink. I, I, I don't do that, uh, thankfully, because I understand that there's always place to learn and to, to make mistakes. I, I, yeah. I give myself the, this, this thing. And The problem, I think, it's that comparison uh, because we are comparing to Gary Vaynerchuk, to yeah. Mary Smith, and uh, uh, all that kind of people. Some of them are there on your book, writing the, <laughs> the review. Well, oh you know, I I try to to remind people too. It's very easy. I've been caught in that trap too of saying you look at someone like Gary V, who's putting out content everywhere. You know, posting multiple times a day across different platforms. It's really important, again, being transparent and human with your audience. Gary has a 40 person team that builds the brand of Gary, right? Sure, he is posting himself, but he has designers and he has video editors and he has podcast editors and he has people who, who comb through his, his keynotes and find great quotes and put them into short videos. When you have a 40 person team working on your content, by all means, hold yourself to that same standard. But until then, it's not fair to you. It's not fair to your audience. We all have to show up as we are, as best we can. And if you don't have that level of resources, then comparing yourself to someone who does is just setting yourself up for disappointment. It's much better to set our sights more realistically based on our resources, based on the time we have, the skills we have, and to deliver really well on the things we can do well consistently. That's going to better serve you, better serve your business, better serve your brand, and better serve your audience. Okay, that's it. Well, <laughs> Priscilla says, apologies, <laughs> Melanie. <laughs> that thing, it should be about your YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> I well, know it's rough. <laughs> well, Melanie, I th I think now we can uh, talk about the process. I mean, um, because I think people will now understand that uh, content is important. You don't have to be a guru right now because I think nobody started a guru. Uh, That's right. At the first step, okay. <laughs> I, I I don't believe that because one of uh, the, the big advantage of um, Content marketing, as I said, I, and I think you 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 have the same opinion. It's uh, how much we learn. 
it's amazing because we give ourselves our own feedback. People give yeah. us the, 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 the feedback. So while you don't, uh, every minute you get stuck, stuck, it's every minute you lose from improving. That's right. Yeah. And so the more you do, I think that's one of the things that's really important to acknowledge too is when you get into the content space and no doubt everyone who's here has gotten this kind of messaging, people start telling you what to do. You start getting best practices, people saying you must do this, you have to do it this way, everyone does this. I always remind people, every piece of recommendation, every piece of advice you're getting from someone was about their content for their audience. You have different content and you have a different audience. And so what works for them may not work for you. It is so, so important to look at your own data, to look at the feedback you're getting from your audience and to decide what works best for you and for them. If you run around chasing other people's best practices, other people's content recommendations, you're going to wind up optimizing your content for their audience. And that's not what you have. So make sure that you're looking at your data, listen to your audience, look at what's working, examine the data that you have to see what's working well that I should keep doing and what's not working for me that I should do a little bit less of. Absolutely. There's, there's something... There's something truly important, and I, I I I talk by myself because there's so many people saying how should I I should do things, and I, I sometimes I wonder uh, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> It's true, right? It's really easy. You joked no one is a guru when they start out, but it is really easy in this day and age to present yourself that way. And so we want to be aware of the fact that, that some of the people out there giving advice, you know, again, not only are they in a different area, a different business with a different audience, but they may not have that much experience either. And surely they have value they can add. They have things they can teach us, but we don't just want to take what someone else is doing and apply it to our business wholesale, you know, for our, everything that we do. That's not a good way. That's a good way to build their business, not yours. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I'm, I want to start, Melanie. Which pieces of advice will you give to me uh, to start? So if you're just getting started in content, you know, there are a few, a few things that I always recommend people try. So um, in the book, if you haven't had a chance to read it, I talk about how every piece of content you create has two parts. It has a focus. That's what your content is about. That's the, the sort of perspective or lens on the book or on the, uh, on the content that you're creating. Maybe it's a book, maybe it's an article or something else. And then you also have the format. That's the way you bring it to life, right? So that could be the book, the article, the podcast, the video, whatever else. So what I always recommend people do is really think about those two things. Start with your focus. What do I want to say? What's my message? What's the goal of the content I'm creating? And then ask, what's the best way to bring that story to life? What format would best suit this story? If you're not really sure which is best, again, in the book, I've got tons of examples that you can draw on and, and really helpful information to help you choose. But the one that I recommend if you're just new is to start with curation. So curation is when you go and collect different resources and present them together. So you're probably familiar with like the roundups, right? Here's 10 books that I think every marketer should read or 15 podcasts you should be listening to if you are interested in social media, things like that. Curation is a really good place to start because it doesn't require a ton of resources and it allows you to use your content creation to also audit your space, to learn new things, to find new experts that you might collaborate with. So curation is a really good place to start. Look for ways you can collect resources for your audience and recommend some, some options that may be interesting for them. Well, it's amazing. It's, a, it's, it's really amazing. Wait, one, one advice I, I used to say to people is to uh, start on comments. I think uh, comments yeah. are a so underrated uh, tool and underused because it's so powerful. It's and true. Uh, I don't know why uh, here in Portugal we have a, a, a problem, which is it's difficult to, to, to make a stand. I know. I mm. mean, Uh, okay, I, I don't want to get stuck to, to my opinion because I'm, it may change and uh, you may. <laughs> so, so, but yeah. it's truly important to stand out, uh, to use comments in an insightful way. So, and th that what, what you said, because when you make some this, this, uh, that curation, uh, it's a nice way to, to get the eyes of those professionals you're, you're talking about, those. Yeah brands and look who is this and 
it's a nice way to stand out and people don't do it. Yeah, I mean, I think people do forget that one type of content is the conversation. It's the replies and the comments and, and that engagement that you're doing with others. So, you know, if that's a great place to start is engaging with other people's content. That if certainly if even creating curated content is a little too scary right now, or you don't have the resources for that, be a part of those important conversations that are happening elsewhere. Chime in, you know, on the other industry influencers, reply to their content, you know, write comments. That's that's a great way to be a part of the content conversation maybe before you're quite at the point where you're ready to create your own content. Perfect. Do you have a, a, a routine to, to recommend? I, I know um, routines uh, work for, for one and for the other, but I think you can always pick some uh, ideas and then yeah. apply to, to your own reality. So specific for content or just for life in general? Well, uh, at, at the end, you will talk, uh, you will talk about for, <laughs> for life, for content right now. Please. Yeah. So one of the things that that I think is is really important for everyone is to to break down your content creation into small parts. So as an example, I think a lot of people say like, "Oh, I need to make a YouTube video or something." That's a really big task with a lot of smaller tasks. And if you try to do all of that in one sitting, it's going to be intimidating. So if you break that down into decide topic for YouTube video, research topic for YouTube video, record YouTube video, edit video, create the thumbnail image, upload the video, right? Now you've broken that down into much smaller parts and you're gonna be much better able to make that content happen. I think sometimes with our content goals, we can set these big goals, you know, start YouTube channel, you know, create blog posts. And it's so big, we often don't know where to start. So that's something that I try to focus on. Anytime I have a content project, I try to break it down into the smallest possible parts. And that really helps me see the process and be more productive because I know what to do next. Oh, perfect. Perfect. It's, it's because that, that's the point when you see a, a so huge uh, work to do. Yeah. And sometimes you don't have any clue from where to start. Uh, should I make the thumbnail? Should I record and then see if, if the, the, this keyword it's, it's this topic, yeah. it's, it's searchable. So right. I think it's, it's a nice way. We have a question from Ilse from sure. Venezuela. <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, uh, hola, Ilse, muchas gracias. Uh, eh, do you understand Spanish? Not well oh. enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if she, she's asking. Uh, Ilse, por favor, dime, si estás preguntando si lo más difícil es crear contenido relevante o consistente o las dos cosas uh, al mismo tiempo. Bueno, I, I, I'm going to read it. Uh, I, I'm going to translate She's asking if it's uh, the most difficult is to create relevant and consistent content. Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges that a lot of people have. I think it's so important that your content is consistent. And that's why setting those realistic goals is really important. So I would always recommend, I would rather you show up once a week or every other week if you're going to do it really well. It's much better to have one great blog post every week or one great video every week than two or three bad ones or just kind of okay ones. It's so much better for you to show up consistently and effectively at the same time. So you want to balance those two things. Where can I show up consistently at a level of quality that I need to? So you want to find the, the balance between those things. Think about like your favorite show on TV. You always know it's going to be on a certain day of the week on a certain channel at a certain time. If one week you showed up and it was on a different channel or on a different day or a different time, it would be really hard for you to be a fan, for you to follow along with the story, for you to feel like you really know what's going on. So we want to give that same gift to our audience that our favorite shows and programs give to us. Show up the same days, the same time on the same channel, because that's going to allow people to find us and follow along and be a fan. Perfect. Yeah, I think I think that's that was the question. <laughs> it doesn't come with. A, okay, uh, I think. Well, it's true. Uh, there's one of the battles I'm I'm facing because when you're a solopreneur, it's it's mostly when you have the live stream as an option, the main option of content creation. Because it sometimes you have a headache, you're tired, you have some appointment at that time. Yeah. 
I will try to to fix this time because it's good for me because at night I'm really tired. <laughs> and so I think this this Thursday at 5 p.m. Uh, GMT plus one. I think it's a nice. Hello, Marco. <laughs> we have another question from Marco Tomazzoni from Italy. Nice. Let us know, Hello. Let, let us know, Marco, please. So, consistency, relevancy, it's important. And well, I think uh, one thing uh, that uh, sometimes uh, there's uh, people, brands and, and professionals miss is the engagement, the feedback they should give, uh, uh, give yeah. to to their audience because if you don't keep it conversational you're missing right that's right yeah i think it's important for us to recognize the wonderful privilege it is that we can have these two-way conversations with our audience even right now the the fact that people can ask questions about things that may be confusing or that they need clarity on and we can answer them in real time i mean that allows for a much better experience for them you know, we want to give that same gift to our audience. You know, if we have opportunities to answer their questions, to listen to their feedback, to create new content that addresses things we haven't talked about before because we know they want to learn about it, that not only helps our audience, which really should be our goal, but it helps us too because we're able to be of service to them. We're able to provide exactly what they're looking for. But you only know to do that if you're listening. Absolutely. And and that's 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 it because if you don't show you're open to the other's ideas, they they will avoid that. That's right. Yeah. And that's that's a pity. Well, we have a really nice question from Marco. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read it. Thank you Marco. Grazie mille. Today I've published uh, my first ebook, totally free, no money, no mail, free. Is it the right choice? How the price can determine the value of a content really nice question yeah that's a that's a really good question so i think uh whether to charge for for a piece of content or sometimes gate it right so sometimes we put it behind an email address or behind a membership or something anytime you create a barrier to someone consuming your content a price an email capture or something else what you do is you bring down the total audience of that content right fewer people are going to make that conversion and engage with it sometimes that's a really smart strategic choice sometimes you need to monetize your content right so for my book the book could be free i guess but for me there's there's costs involved with getting something printed with getting it edited and designed so we need to charge for that in order for it to work but sometimes there's also an advantage to having something that's free it allows people to engage with you more deeply it makes sure you're able to reach people more widely so sometimes pairing those two things together is a really good way to do it so just to give you an example, my book, you have to pay to get the book, right? It's a paid product, but there are resources on the website that are free. So if you read the book and you're looking for additional resources, we have this little, I call it a cheat sheet. It's sort of like a summary of all the, the key points in the book. Now it doesn't make a lot of sense if you haven't read the book, it won't be super helpful for you. But if you have read the book, there are some free resources that are available. So printable items, maybe checklists and you know workbooks and things like that you could create that are complimentary. So since you have a free ebook, what I would really encourage you to do is think about how that fits into your overall business landscape and whether that free product can lead to paid products or lead to capturing people's uh, contact information so you may be able to build their audience down the line. I think what's most important, regardless of whether you decide to charge or give content away for free, is understanding why you're doing that and how it's serving your broader goals. Because if your goal was to make money, well then charging nothing wouldn't help. If your goal was to build an email list, but they don't have to give you their email in order to get the book, then it's not going to help with that either. If your goal is simply to reach as many people as possible and really get your message out there, then having it free is one of the best ways you can do that. So I think it's kind of a choice. You just want to make sure you're making that choice with intention and that it's strategic for you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm always saying, and I, I made those mistakes and i still doing i think intentionality it's key uh, at this point yeah. because one thing i i used to say to when i'm doing my trainings or my consultancies is yeah. have the end in mind and then get back and see how you can go there and i think okay. if you have in mind uh, and i believe that marco has it, a guy who named Marco should be. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, 
can't believe the, the opposite. And I think it's important to have this because there's there's also that that I think it's a, a huge problem when you are um, creating content. And I think that they lay in the very two opposite ways, which is one is to sell, sell, sell. And the, the other yeah. one is give, give, give. And there's no uh, a path. Okay, I'm giving this, but because I want to... Uh, get you there uh, a CTA at the end and a, a strong CTA don't you think that there's th this problem and how can we uh, make it smoother I think one of the things that's a, a big challenge is figuring out how do you how do you go from providing value to then making some sort of conversion right you don't want it to feel like a, a change at the end um, and the data actually shows that when you have a non-sales piece of content you have you know, whether it's a blog post or, or a video and it's mostly value. And then at the very end, it switches to like very sales or very call to action. That generally leaves a bad taste in people's mouth because they feel like they got tricked, right? I thought I was here to learn and now all of a sudden you're telling me I have to buy something, right? So we don't wanna wait till the very end and make it sort of like a, a change up, right? Where they thought they were getting one thing and well, surprise, we're really just here to sell you. What you want to do is you want to find a way to naturally integrate toward the middle of the content. That's what most of the data shows is most effective. Now, what that means is you probably have to tone that message down a little bit so that it doesn't feel like such a sharp change in the middle. Rather than having it be 0% sales and then 100% sales, what you really want to do is have it be 0% sales and then maybe a little bump there in the middle and then back down to value so that you have value on each side. That's really one of the best ways you can do it. The best thing you can do, if possible, is allude to how you have helped someone in a paid way in the past. So I'll give you an example. If I were writing a blog post about how you can adjust your content during the, the pandemic, right? Maybe you need to change your content strategy. I could write a whole bunch of tips and then at the end say, and if you want help changing your content in the time of COVID, reach out to Story Fuel and we'll help you do some consulting. That would probably feel really icky. Instead, toward the middle of the piece, I would say, We've worked with a number of clients and we've helped them do this in this way. Here's a story of a client who made that change and they had positive outcomes. Now on to another tip and then go back to providing value. So by, by doing it, by showing something you've done before that aligns with it, by giving sort of a, a branded example, if you will, it allows you to have that conversation, to make it clear that there's a sales opportunity, but then to go right back to giving value so the customer feel, and the, the audience feels like that's still your focus is on providing value. Perfect. And th th that's a good point to talk about the others, because I think it's also um, a problem because uh, corporate language, which for me, make it's, it's something scary. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so great is all uh, most of the time it's about us, about me and not yes. about the others um and also it's really squared i, I don't uh, how storytelling can uh get into it i think we oftentimes find that like you're saying corporate language is very very like firm it's not very exciting it's very structured and sometimes that just that's just not compelling um, what we know is that stories about people are some of the most relatable stories there are. We love learning about people who are similar to us in some way. Maybe they have the same challenge, the same solution. Uh, they have a life that's similar to ours. That's, that's always helpful for people. They can see themselves in that content. So whenever possible, we want to try to include people in our content, whether it's us or someone else. But like you said, no one really likes content that's all about someone else, right? We do want to feel like it's for us in some way. And the example I give is right now, I want you to think of the last time you were having a conversation with someone, maybe over dinner at the pub, uh, you know, a dinner party or on the phone, and they only talked about themselves the whole time. They didn't ask you any questions. They were barely listening to you and they just talked about themselves. It's the worst. No one likes that conversation. No one has fun, right? The whole time you're just thinking, how do I get out of this conversation? Because this person doesn't even need me here. They're just gonna keep talking about themselves, right? We don't wanna be that person for our audience. We don't wanna be the person who's only ever talking about ourselves. Here's me, here's what I sell, meet my team, come to our event, buy my product. Why would someone sign up to be a part of that conversation, right? It's all about us. 
So whenever possible, we want to find a way to shine the light on other people. Sometimes that's putting the light directly on the customer. It's saying, we're talking to you and here's how we can help you, right? It's really focusing on the person who's consuming that content. Other times it's talking about people who are in our orbit. So talking about our employees, talking about our customers, our vendors, our community partners, our neighbors, right? If we're a local business, having a conversation about the other people, not just us, but the other people who are part of our brand's network is a really good way to have a more human conversation. And again, to bring faces and voices into your content in a way that makes it more relatable. Absolutely. Because uh, th that's it. If you don't feel engaged with the conversation, then uh, if the company was founded in 2010 or 2018 you know, in the uh, 15th century, <laughs> it doesn't matter to you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And we see it so often. Um, and I think, I think it's great. I, I was looking at the index of your book and the, the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to the, to the formats, which is the, uh, I think it's also a really, because you put it in the, uh, a, a blended way, I, I, if if it's the right uh, word to 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 make it, which is the 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 focus you should have on, and then the, the types. Uh, and I yeah. think it's because it makes uh, like uh, 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 exponential explosion yeah. of kinds of stuff. Because oh, I don't know what to, I don't know because what problem? And the, again. I can't go live, for instance. I, I don't feel comfortable with live streaming. Yeah. And I, I understand that. Uh, sometimes I try to sell the idea, but uh, for me, it's easy after two minutes of conversation. Okay, it's right now it's not for you. Right. Go in another way. So in your opinion, which are the less risky formats that uh, people can embrace? Uh, yeah to start. So I think when we talk about the formats, you know, and you said the, the sort of exponential explosion, I just want to show this graphic that's from the book. So <laughs> when we talk about the, the focuses, those are things like we focus on people or we focus on process, on curation, which we talked about. Those are across the top. And then on the side are the different formats that we'll talk about now. Things like writing, infographic, video, live video. So what you end up with is a hundred possible combinations, a hundred different ways to tell the same story. Now, not all of them will be right. You know, it might not be, you know, maybe live video is not for you. Um, but I think there are some that are probably more approachable if you have limited resources, if you have limited time, uh, or if you just have to choose where to focus your attention. So I think if you have the ability, then doing video is probably the best bet. And the reason for that is you can really, you know, make more out of a video once it's done. Think about it. A video has visuals, so you could take screenshots. It has audio. You could extract that and make a podcast. You can take still images from those video from that video. You could cut the video down into smaller clips. You can transcribe the audio and turn it into written content. So when you have a video to start with, it gives you so much that you can work with to sort of break it apart and make more content out of it. So if you can, that's where I would start. If you can't do video for whatever reason, then I think writing is one of the most portable content formats. By that, I mean that when you write a piece of content, you can pick bits out of that and reuse them in different places. So you could use them as captions on social media. You can turn those that text into some sort of graphic and post that on social media. You can perhaps read some of those clips out loud and have audio as well. So writing is usually one of the easiest for us to start with because so many of us, we write every day. You're writing a comment now under this video. You've written text messages and, and emails today, right? So writing is probably the most approachable if you have limited resources or if you just want to try some things out writing is a really easy way to, to kind of bring things to life but what i will say is most writing performs best when it's paired with another format so you know writing that comes with a video or writing that also has an infographic most of the blog posts and articles we look at they have a photo with them so think about some ways you might start with writing and then slowly work your way into trying some of the other ones to make sure that engagement is happening for you well, it's perfect, and I have I, I have to talk about this format because for me it came so many ideas, which is the quiz, because I think quiz is not too risky, not too risky, not too risky, and 
it's an, an amazing way for you to validate your ideas and yep. to to get more ideas from your uh, audience and yeah. more feedback, don't you think? Yeah, so a quiz is one of those formats. It's in the book and I think most people forget that that's a format we can create content in, right? Quizzes are really great for testing your audience's knowledge on something. So uh, how much do you know about running shoes? How do you know how to pick the right running shoe? If you're running on, uh, on pavement, which of these would be the best kind, right? You can test your audience's knowledge. And when you find gaps in those knowledge, you can suggest products that help fill those gaps. So if I got the questions wrong and I'm making the wrong shoe decision, right? I bought the wrong running shoes. Then that company gets to say, hey, for the type of running you're doing, it looks like you probably need to, to have these particular shoes and not those particular shoes. So it's a great way to test knowledge and make product recommendations. But it's also a really fun way to separate your audience into different categories that they might identify with. So you think about, my guess is most of us have completed a BuzzFeed quiz at some point. We might not be proud of it, but there's a lot of those quizzes that say, you know, which Game of Thrones character are you? Or, you know, what would your order be at the ice cream parlor, right? Something silly like that. It's really fun for people to identify in those ways, say, oh yeah, I'm definitely that character, or that's definitely the choice I would make. So it can also just be a fun way to engage your audience while also getting a chance to talk about the things that are important to you as a brand. Absolutely. Well, uh, Priscilla says some great ideas. Uh, thank you, Priscilla. Uh, I, I, for instance, uh, this late feature that LinkedIn released, um, the, the, the polls, for mm -hmm. me, it's huge because I, I'm figuring um, how do my uh, public, my, my community sees live streaming, how yeah. many... How many, because one thing, um, and uh, one thing that I, I do also is to, a poll gives me uh, ideas to bring up the next one. That's and right. So for instance, I made one, what are you avoiding? Uh, it's stopping you from uh, going live. And somebody told me, I have this problem with time. And then I made another poll about how many time do you have by week? To yeah. create content. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's a really good way to do it. The the other thing that's really valuable about this kind of stuff is it also gives you a chance to get your audience invested in the content that you're going to create. So again, this is an example that's coming from my own experience with the book. So before we chose this cover, I actually shared some of the potential covers and asked people which one's their favorite, right? So now those people are invested. They feel like they had a role in answering the question and helping create the outcome. So if you were to ask your audience, you know, what are some of your biggest challenges in creating live video, then hearing from them, they go, oh, this is the video they made for me. This video is the one that I said I needed help with. So it creates a feeling of like partnership. People feel like they played a role in helping you come up with content and they are more invested in that content because they suggested it or they voted on it. Absolutely. And that's what I, I'm making. I, I made it one and it was curious because I started the, the video on Portuguese and then some people came uh, uh, popping comments in English and then, okay, let's do, let's do the, the live <laughs> show in English. <laughs> Sometimes, but see, that's the audience feedback, right? You were listening to your audience yeah, absolutely. and it allowed you to adjust your content in real time. Yeah, uh, uh, for me, for me, live streaming, it's, it's, as you said, it's really powerful. Um, everything that you, even though I, I need a team to, to take advantage of everything because it's, it's huge, uh, what you can make with this. But there's something I need to ask because there's here the content multiplier. Content multipliers. <laughs> what They're is like, this? <laughs> these, so we talk about these at the end of the book. The, a content multiplier is like a secret weapon to take one piece of content and turn it into five, 10, 15, 20 pieces of content. So I'll give you a great example that's relevant to what we're talking about right now. So let's say that Marco, you made a video about how small business owners can take advantage of live video. And that video did really well, right? So many people showed up, you had a lot of engagement. Most of us, we pat ourselves on the back and we go, wow, great video, on to the next one, right? What we should do instead is say, how can I take this piece of content that how small business owners can use live video and multiply it in different ways? So I give examples of this in the book 
One great one is time. So this maybe doesn't work so well for, for our particular video, but you could do how, how they can take advantage of video or how small businesses can take advantage of video during the pandemic, how they can take advantage of it during the holidays, uh, how they can you do it uh, early morning or late at night, right? So that would be one way to repeat that content for different groups. But probably the best multiplier for a piece of content like that would be for demographics. So you'd say how independent um, restaurants could take advantage of live video, how dog groomers could take advantage of live video, how yoga instructors could take advantage of live video. So instead of just saying small business owners, how do you break it down into different subsets of that audience, those different types of small businesses and create more pieces of content that are specific to each of them? So this is a way you take what is working really well and how can I multiply that success by repeating the content in different ways? Well, because I, I think, and I, I have this challenge, I, I should uh, overcome it because I'm always thinking about creating new content, new content in, instead of, um, and I think it's it's a, a, a common mistake. People want, instead of reusing the content and those who are working well, because I think one, one there's this problem. I don't want to bore my audience by uh, sending the same piece of content one and, and twice. And <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I think two, two distinctions here. One, um, when we talk about multiplying your content, we don't mean take the same article and just put a new headline on it and publish it again. That's going to hurt you in your search engine optimization. That's not what we're uh, yeah, what we mean. But there might be ways in which a dog grooming studio and a restaurant and a yoga instructor, they could do different things. So for example, you know, maybe the dog grooming, uh, the dog grooming studio can use live video to answer people's questions about their dogs, right? Or they could do a dog fashion show. I don't know. Uh, but maybe <laughs> yeah. the yoga studio can use live to do uh, can to do coaching or use live to run a live class, right? There's going to be different answers for those different audiences. So you only want to multiply content when you can make adaptations that make it unique and relevant for each audience. But the other thing that's important to know is just wondering, Marco, if you are not a yoga instructor, would you click on a link that said, here's how yoga instructors could use live video? Probably not. It's not for you, right? If you're not a dog groomer, you're not going to click on the video that's about how dog grooming studios can use it, right? So when we create split content that is specific about who it's for, we're not going to bore the audience because no one's going to watch all of those because all of them aren't for them. And that's why it's so important for us to really think about who is our content for and how are we creating content that is specific to those different audience groups. That's where they're not going to get bored because they're only going to find that content that's most relevant for them. Absolutely. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, perfect. Well, we are almost coming to an end, please. <laughs> well, it's amazing. Before before this, the suggestion, maybe if you can give me uh, uh, some tips about starting a um, process. Of, well, one of them is to buy the book. <laughs> no question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But uh, some some questions for people who are thinking or with uh, want they are rethinking the way they create content by these days. Mm -hmm. Which piece of of advices will you give them? So again, if you're starting out, I think really think first before you ever start creating something. We talked about setting your goals. Think about why you are creating content. Are you creating content because you want to build an audience? Because you want to grow your reputation? You want to you know, increase your sales. You have to be clear on what your goal is so that you make sure your content activities are going to help you achieve that goal. So think critically about why content is important to you and then decide what content activities are gonna help me do that, right? So just, we gave the example before, if your goal is to create, uh, to create an audience, but you're putting out your content on a platform that doesn't allow subscriptions, like, you know, then you're not going to grow that audience, right? Or you don't give people the option to subscribe. And how do you grow that audience? So really think about your goals and then focus on content activities that help with that goal. The next thing you want to do is ask yourself the question, where can I show up consistently in a quality way? 
So don't, don't set a goal so big that you set yourself up for failure. It's really important that we start at a realistic point. Maybe that's one blog post a month for now. And as we get better, we do two blog posts a month. And as we get better, we do three blog posts a month. Start realistic and go up from there rather than starting so big and, and feeling like you can't do it. So, so decide your goal and then start realistic. Those are, I think, the, the two best things you can do if you're just starting out. Perfect, perfect, amazing. Well, Ryan is saying this is great stuff. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. And there's another question from uh, Marco. The last question from me. How useful it is to publish sometimes content completely detached from, from my main focus. It can help to give a human image or of or can ruin your brand. So this is a good question. I think Again, we all, yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we all deal with this, right? Where how much of my communications are about me as a business or me as a, a business person uh, versus me as a human. Uh, I think the answer to that is truthfully different for everyone. Um, if you're talking about a brand like Tide or Volkswagen or Coca-Cola, we don't need to see the human side, right? That's not about a person. We're not buying from a person, we're buying from a company. If you yourself are the brand, like me, I'm I'm a brand, right? People hire me as a coach or as a speaker or a virtual trainer. They need to know about me as a person. They want to know who they're doing business with. So for me, I try to strike a balance where most of my content is about my business, about my products, about the value that I can give to my audience. But I do try to sprinkle in occasionally posts about my life, you know, maybe a photo of me with my daughter or a vacation photo every now and then. You want to just make sure that it's proportional because if someone shows up to your blog or your platform and your last five or six, six posts are about your dog and your lunch and your vacation, how are they going to know what value you can provide, what services or products they could buy from you? So think about that balance. You know, how much of your time do you really want spent, uh, want your audience to spend sifting through the personal stuff to get to the business stuff? So I think that that balance is different for everyone. It, again, it depends on how much of your brand is you as a person. Uh, if you are a personal brand or a person-based brand, then you want to make sure there's at least some of your personal life to whatever degree you're comfortable sprinkled in there. And I think an occasional post on that topic uh, is good. What I would do is just set a limit for yourself or a goal for yourself. You know, once a week on social media, I will post something that's more personal. Um, or, you know, every third photo will be of my dog or my house or whatever else. Uh, just set a goal or a limit for yourself so you can keep track of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, I, I used to say, as yes, one, one, thing, <laughs> one thing people should uh, uh, keep asking me about the background. What should I have on the background? And I, I used to say, minimum a neutral, a neutral thing to the live you're doing. But... Yep. Uh, the, uh, the optimist is to reinforce your message. And for me, it's the same when we are talking about our personal life, because sometimes yeah. the, the connection starts there. Oh, that's right. I, I, I like to make windsurf. Oh, I like windsurf too. Oh my God. Exactly. That, that's it. Yeah. I can't tell you how many. So I, I have a young daughter who's uh, <laughs> coming up on a year old soon. And I can't tell you how many times I've been on a call with a client and they say, oh, I saw you have a young daughter. How old is she? When's her birthday? You know, uh, does she also love this show? You know, they, it's a way for you to connect when people know your, your personal side. And so if that's important, if creating that in interpersonal connection is important, then you want to make sure you're, you're sharing enough for people to connect with you. Absolutely. Well, Marco says, thanks a lot, guys. Amazing live. Congrats. Thank you. Grazie mille, Marco. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah. So, Melanie, before yeah. asking you the how people can uh, find you, there's the suggestions from my guest uh, that I want to ask you. I didn't ask you before, but that's a kind of surprise. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, a professional that you want, that, that you like, and you think that people should follow him or her. A book, um, a habit you have, okay. <laughs> a tool, okay. a movie, and a series. Oh my don't God. don't okay. bother because I, I I I can recap. I'll try to remember. A professional. Uh, so a professional. I would recommend if you're looking to create more content and particularly writing is something you are interested in. I would follow Anne Handley. 
Uh, okay. She wrote the book, Everybody Writes, which is my book recommendation. Uh, and I think it's a really good place to start if you want to get more comfortable and confident in creating written content. So Anne Hanley and uh, her book, Everybody Writes. Uh, next is a habit, right? So habit, yes. um, one of my favorite habits is I follow what I call the two minute rule, which was introduced in the book, Getting Things Done by David Allen. And the idea is if a task will take you less than two minutes to complete, you should do it right now because it will actually take you longer in the long run to put it on your to-do list, come back to it, and then go do it next time. So two minute rule, if it takes less than two minutes, try to get it done right away. That's a habit that helps me. The next one is a tool. A tool, right? yes. All right, so a tool. I use a tool called Todoist. So it's T-O-D-O-I-S-T. -O -O -I That's the tool that I use to manage all of my, my action items, uh, my projects, my timelines. Um, there are a lot of tools that do this, you know, so, so use whatever one works for you. But Todoist is a tool that I absolutely love. I've been using it, gosh, for like eight plus years, I think. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's a tool that I absolutely love, Todoist. Uh, let's see, what else was next? Movie. Movie. <laughs> mm. So I, I just recently saw the movie Parasites, which I know I'm way behind the curve on that one. It's been out for a long time and has won a number of awards, um, but was really an incredible movie. So if you haven't seen it, make sure you Yeah, I don't, I should. <laughs> see I should. it. See. Yeah. A, a what? A, a series. series. Yeah. Um, like. like a TV show? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. I recently watched Community for the first time. It's a show about uh, a group of kids at a community college and it was very funny and I needed that. You know, I needed a little bit of levity in my life and all of the, the chaos that was going on during the early part of the lockdown. So Community brought a lot of laughs into our house when we first went into lockdown. Perfect. Well, Melanie, so good. <laughs> I believe that people, which please say thank you to Melanie and give her uh, some hearts or likes, whatever. And please, Melanie, tell people how they can find you. The, the, the book link is already there. But okay, so the, the book link is down at the bottom. Uh, you can learn more about the book at contentfuelframework.com. Very easy. It's just the name of the book, contentfuelframework.com. There you'll learn about the, the workbook that we have, about if you wanna get a signed copy, uh, all kinds of options there. Also, you'll see right here, storyfield.co is our website. So if you wanna know more about the other things we do to help marketers and creators tell better stories, things like coaching, masterminds, we can lead virtual trainings for your team, all kinds of other fun stuff, definitely check out storyfuel.co. And I would love to connect with you all on social. I'm very active on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram, LinkedIn. Facebook, wherever you want to find me, Melanie Diesel, D-E-Z-I-E-L, and you will find me. Perfect. Well, <laughs> it was amazing. I think I think we should should make a, a sequel. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Well, Melanie, thank you a lot. Wish you a nice Thursday and an amazing weekend. Here in Portugal, we are almost in weekend because we have yesterday it was the Portugal's day. It was mm. a holiday. Today it's another holiday, uh, a religious Lucky one. You. Uh, tomorrow we have. We used to say we make a bridge when the the holidays is uh, on Tuesday or on thur Thursday. We used to make a bridge. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I will go live also. Thank you a lot. It was a pleasure. It was an uh, amazing conversation about something that I I love so much, which is which is content marketing. With someone who knows a lot about the topic, it's even better. So hope you enjoyed. And I, I did. want to thank you a lot and uh, look forward to have another conversation. And yeah. also, uh, I'll be, uh, how do I say, I will be looking if you, there's something new you will be releasing. And please let me know if you have something in mind and something that you're launching or something to yeah. have you again on the show. and. I would love that. That okay? I would love that. Thanks for letting me come and share my story. And I hope this was really helpful for all of you who tuned in. I hope that you're able to go out there and tell better stories because the world needs your story. So go out and tell it. Absolutely. Well, people, thank you a lot. If you are seeing the re watching the replay, please let uh, drop some comments and questions to Melanie. Follow Melanie on the social so uh, you can uh, follow what he's bringing to you and uh, there's a lot of 
amazing content that Melanie is sending to us. So take care. <laughs> Have a nice day and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.